everything, Franklin. Jurgen? Yes, sir. He can make it by himself. Keep an eye on that man. Don't let him out of your sight. Right, sir. Right after you, soldier. The way things are going, I won't have to keep an eye on you long. Let's go. Who are you staring at? Only you who you think I'm staring at. What for? I got a special interest in everything you do. You move. I'm aiming straight at your belly. What is the countersign? What are you talking about? There isn't any countersign. The hell there ain't. They gave it to us before we went up last night. Now you just say that word or I'll shoot. Franklin. That's right. But I don't know who you are. Not without that countersign. Well, you know I'm no Chinese. Come on, get out of here. And serve ten years? You think I'm stupid, but I ain't that stupid. Not when I can kill you right now. Nobody can call it murder. Nobody but you. Not even me. Ten years, you say. Real quick, like you said. Ten years for what? Because I don't want to die for Korea. What I care about this stinking hill. You ought to see where I live back home. I sure ain't sure I'd die for that. So since I ain't gonna die for Korea, save ten years for it neither. From Woody Strode's biography, Gold Dust, written by Woody Strode and Sam Young. I was in Sid Gold's office one day and James Edwards said, Woody, I just got a part in Lewis Milestone's new picture and there's a part in it that's perfect for you. Take the script, go home, learn the lines. And then we'll go over it. That was Porkchop Hill. Milestone was the one who made all quiet on the Western Front, which set the standard for all war pictures. It was a nice scene. And what James Edwards did was teach me to underplay. Before I auditioned for the part, I went home and learned the lines and met him up at his house. It was like an emergency course. He would play the scene for me, and I would step in and copy him. He said, Woody. You're so big, don't shout the lines underplay, just let the words come out. Before I went on the interview with Cy Bartlett, the producer in Milestone, Jimmy said, When you get to the office, if you hear the other actors reading, get out of the room. Don't get on their level. He was afraid if I heard their performance, I'd do it the same way. I went to the audition and waited. I heard the other actors through the door, they were shouting. I told the secretary, I'm going into the bathroom, would you knock when you're ready for me, please? They called my name. And I slid into the office. I had the script rolled up in the back pocket of my blue jeans. And I played the bunker scene. I reached way down to the bottom of my stomach and pulled the lines out in a whisper. Menacing. I had stature, so I underplayed. Well, every black actor in Hollywood showed up for the job. And I got it. beautiful girl I've ever seen. And don't you forget I said it to you. But you make one move to get away and I'm gonna kill you. Yes, sir. But that's just what you'll have to do. 
Tom, you're not going to take him back now, are you? For the first time, I don't really know what I'm going to do. Because you know they'll hang him if you do. You know he never touched that girl. Hold it, Red Lights! Hold it! starred in John Ford's 1935 classic, The Informer. His performance won an Academy Award. Victor McLaughlin's career may have never risen above that of a character actor if not for John Ford's ability to squeeze out the best from his actors, often having to misdirect them. In Victor McLaughlin's case, John Ford got him drunk the previous night, then chided him the next day before his great court scene, made him feel guilty and ashamed, the very qualities which his character Dippo Nolan needed John Ford wanted Woody Strode to be the first African-American to win an Academy Award for Best Actor. In order to do this, he had to trick Woody, whose athletic discipline, early to bed, early to rise, early to the set, lines memorized, ready, and prepared, was exactly what John Ford did not want for his big court scene. He wanted Woody vulnerable, afraid, angry, and confused. So he did to him what he had done to Victor McLaughlin. He tricked Woody into getting drunk the night before the big scene in Woody's own words. When Mr. Ford showed up, he didn't bother with hellos or talking to any of the production people. He came right over to where I was sitting. He leaned down, stuck his nose right in my face and sniffed. Oh, you've been drinking, have you? He said it real loud like he didn't know. Uh, yes, sir, I'm sorry. I've never done this before. I was playing right into his hands. We sat down and I ran through a few lines. He interrupted. Oh, you know your goddamn lines, do you? I had never known a director to get mad over an actor knowing their lines. He sat there, fists clenched, tight as a coiled rattlesnake ready to strike. He studied me, his good eye piercing through that wrinkled, craggy face as I ran through my dialogue. When I finished, he growled at me. Do you think you can do the courtroom scene now? He had me in a pressure cooker. I said, hey, yes sir, I'm ready. I took the stand. I felt like an exposed nerve and the old man was twisting the knife. He had me all pissed off emotionally, teetering right on the edge. Because the Ninth Cavalry is my home and my self-respect. If I had deserted them, I wouldn't be nothing but a swamp running nigger and I ain't that. I'm a man. That broke me up. And I stood up and broke the chair. And that was the truest moment I ever had on the screen.